Our guest today is Anna Ruiz, a transformational relationship coach sharing her gifts to help people flourish in all kinds of relationships. She's known as the queen of conflict repair and empowers individuals, couples, and families to live harmoniously. Whether you're single, coupled, or part of a family, Anna believes you can achieve your dream relationship. When she's not helping others mend and strengthen their bonds, she enjoys life in scenic Seattle with her husband, Brett, and their kitty, Valentina. <laughs> Welcome, Anna. Thank you, Ash. That was a great introduction. Thank you. And um, I feel grateful for being here. And thank you for everyone who's listening. Yeah, my my pleasure for the introduction. And this part of me that's always wanted to go to Seattle. <laughs> um, I think uh, if I were you, I would follow that uh, because it is a beautiful city. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I had a, a friend message me yesterday with a photo and he's he, he I didn't know he was in Seattle, but he was in Seattle and he was at a hockey game. And I thought, okay, I, I, I want to do that. I'm going to have to put that on my very, very long list of things to do. <laughs> and if you ever come out, I'll promise to take you out for dinner or for coffee or, or something or maybe to a hockey game. Okay. Do you, uh, do you like hockey? I, yeah, I do. And in fact, the hockey stadium is just 20 minute walking distance from our house. Right. Okay. All right. Well, if I come to Seattle, I'll I'll definitely let you know. Okay. Yeah. So, Anna, shall we jump off and, and straight into your turning point? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. All right. Well, feel free to, to share away. Yes. So for me, my main turning point in life happened in when I was 33 years old and I had just come back home from a week long yoga retreat and I had signs of a spiritual awakening that my friends just got really nervous about what was going on with me didn't know what to do. So they actually took me to the emergency room. And I was long story short, I was hospitalized. Um, and I was diagnosed with uh, bipolar disorder. And I was given antipsychotics to just come back from the high that I was experiencing. Mm. And yeah, and so I'm I'm curious, how does one differentiate between a spiritual awakening and a, a bipolar episode? Yeah. To be honest with you, in my personal experience, I don't think there is a difference. It's just the lens of how that experience is looked at. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's a spiritual awakening because it's like um jumping to another level of consciousness so it's like going through a portal mm -hmm. and I can see this in the 18 years that I had a numerous of these bipolar episodes or spiritual awakenings it always feels like crossing a portal and jumping a level of consciousness mm -hmm. so what happens is from the medical point of view, they don't understand these experiences to the depth that other schools of thought have uh, studied them. And therefore they label them as mental illness. Um, but there is um, um, shaman, a Western shaman from Western Africa and his name is Malido Masome. And he already transitioned. He's not alive anymore. Um, he was the first one to come to um, psychiatric wards in the United States and look at the conditions in which uh, patients were, were staying in the hospital with bright lights, how they were in isolation. And he was the first one to say that out publicly and, and publish an article where he talked about his findings 
And he was the first one to say that um, mental illness are individuals who are shamans in training. Mm. Yeah, I've heard something like that before. And yeah, it's an interesting perspective. We might come back to that one. I'm going to make a note here. Um, did the And so you were hospitalized and then you said on antipsychotic medita meditation, antipsychotic meditation, right? There we go. There's a new term, um, antipsychotic medication. And mm -hmm. then you, what happened after that? So what happened after that is I, it was interesting enough because I had just started uh, going to psychotherapy for the first time ever in my life. So I had been going to psychotherapy. And after that episode, I returned to psychotherapy. And what happened was, I remember asking the doctors, um, so, okay, this is the diagnosis. And I asked, what's the cure? And they said to me, there's no cure. This is something you have to live with for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. And being that very first experience that I had, I didn't want to remember that that was true. So I went on a journey to study and seek answers and find a cure to the bipolar disorder. Because what happened is being in an inside antipsychotics was very disruptive for me um, because they made me feel very sluggish. Um, having these experiences, I knew there was more than just what the doctors were saying. And, um, and as a side note, my mother was also diagnosed with bipolar disorder growing up and she was put on the wrong medication. So she was misdiagnosed, put on the wrong medication and she was suicidal when I was growing up. So the one reason why I wanted to find a cure was because I didn't wanna have a similar experience to what my mother had being suicidal and, and taking, taking medication. So that's, that was my main motivation to put myself on a path to find healing. Mm. Yes. And I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm feeling what you're saying. And I had a similar experience in that in 2009, I was in a mental health clinic and it, the psychiatrist diagnosed bipolar. But what I discovered over time was it was actually post-traumatic stress. Mm -hmm. And the for me, the medications didn't work. But I just had this voice in my head that just kept saying, go natural, go natural, go natural. And so, yeah, I, I feel a similarity in that, that there's, uh, there's another way to heal. But And also, I want to acknowledge for people that are listening that Whatever your path is and whatever you feel is right for you, that's the right choice. And we're having a conversation. This isn't advice. We're having a conversation. So if you're listening, make your own choices and make them the best that are for you. And, and this is a conversation. It's, a, it's not medical advice. And so you decided that you're going to find another way to heal. All right. Yeah. I needed to find answers. I needed to understand what was happening to me. And what I learned is that I had layers and layers and layers of trauma that really started when I was um, a year and a half old. And my older sister died. She was five. She was under my parents' watch. And my mother's grief was so intense that she couldn't really function. So mm -hmm. she gave me to a nanny to take care of me 24 by seven. So I was a year and a half old and in the hands of the nanny. And my perception was my, my sister is gone. My mother is gone. And my dad is at work because he had to work to sustain the family. Mm -hmm. So that's when my first experience of, of deep trauma started and it just continued. Um, 
and then the being hospitalized was just another layer of trauma. So throughout my life, I had multiple experiences of trauma and that accumulation of trauma really like fractured my nervous system, um, the connections in my brain. And that was one of the things that was at the root cause of the uh, bipolar disorder or the symptoms of that I was experiencing. Yeah, I can relate to the the, the that fracturing and and the the trauma causing that sense of fracturing. So, and so, how did you how did you go about healing? Yeah, so it's been eighteen years of eighteen nineteen years of trying different things. Uh, for many years, I studied energy healing and I practiced energy healing to work on myself and, and understand more of the other realms that were part affecting my, impacting my own body and my own experience. Um, I also became um, a yoga, um, a yoga teacher, a certified yoga teacher. Um, I became a yoga therapist as well because one of the things that I noticed is that I was very I I'm still are uh, very sensitive and um, sensitive to my own suffering and sensitive to the suffering of others so I I always put myself on positions where I could serve and be of help to other people and that's what spending time in the yoga yoga community uh, helped me with and um, I did psychotherapy. I did, I worked with coaches. And uh, in working with coaches, I found, um, I'm just reviewing my, my notes. Yeah, vegetarian. Mm -hmm. I became vegetarian for many years, thinking that was the solution. And, um, and in speaking with, um, reading books from Malido Masome and articles by him, one of the things that I was told was that I needed to find my soul's purpose, mm. connect with my soul purpose and uh, bring that into, into life, into my life. Mm. And so that, that I found that halfway through like all my searching and, and finding finding answers and so I used to work in software um, I used to work for software companies and my background is computers and I realized that I was living a life where I was financially independent I was I was living in a beautiful city um, I had a great job and I didn't have friends I didn't have like meaningful friendships. I also didn't have uh, relationships, a romantic relationship. I, I had a series of failed romantic relationships. So when I started to put all the pieces together, I realized that my sole purpose is to, to help people. And I started to look at avenues for help and the yoga teaching yoga and doing yoga therapy was one way to help. And then from there, I connected with the next piece in my journey, which was I started starting relationships. Mm -hmm. Relationships, psychology, just ways to connect with human beings and to understand why it was so hard for me to connect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's something we often hear about purpose and that that what you were deprived of, so deprived of connection as a young child, then now becomes your your soul's purpose and an area of expertise. Yeah, yeah. And so in the area of just my own healing, it was so interesting how as on what on one path I'm starting to study relationships. And my relationship teacher had a mentor of the name John Demartini. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You've mm. heard that name before. Yes, definitely. Definitely. I have 
two of his books just sitting behind me and and also yeah I you know, regularly listen to his work yeah so two years ago, I took a dive into his work. I learned he, the, the Martini Method. I attended a bre the Breakthrough Experience. Um, I continued studying with him, did other, other trainings with him. And he was the one that just the, la the last piece that I was looking for in the healing of the bipolar disorder happened when I met him. Hmm. I'm sitting at a break breakthrough experience class with him and he's talking about his method and he says, and on one side, if you are feeling elated, bipolar, schizophrenic, and that just piqued my my curiosity because that was the last piece of the puzzle that I had been looking for. Hmm. I'm curious, can you tell tell me more about that? Yeah. So I'm going to try to explain it in, in simple terms because it's actually more complex than, than, mm -hmm. than what we have time. And so basically what he talks about is everything is dualities. Um, everything in, li in life and the universe ex exists in pairs. There's night and day. There's good and bad. There's happiness or suffering so everything is in pairs and the idea is to keep everything in balance so in someone who has been diagnosed with bipolar disorder their perceptions are they're elated hmm. so they their perceptions of of things positive are seven to one ratio of things mm -hmm. negative. So mm -hmm. they tend to be just leaning on this side of just being too positive and being elated. And they're out of homeostasis. So the psychotic episodes are ways that the body tries to come back into equilibrium. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? It does. So that the natural state is balance and that, you know, to use the Dr. John D. Martini, we become emotionally, emotionally charged and it becomes out of balance. And then, and that's often linked to expectations of how we want things to be or, or illusions of how things should be or, or delusions of how things for example relationships yeah yeah and when things are, are out of balance that's when disease happens because it's a way for nature and the body and to come back into help us come back into balance mm, so mm. yeah so doing his method has really been the piece that I've been spending, I spent about a year working on, on his method. And that really has been the key that has helped me um, stop the need for hospitalizations. And yeah. Mm. Yeah. I'm feeling into that, that, well, I felt my heart and I'm like, ah, healing, healing. What a beautiful gift healing is. Yeah. And and it's a feeling of, of healing and integration. Mm -hmm. I think that for me, the experience of healing is integrating these parts of me that were kind of like either rejected or in the shadow or that I was like pushing away or that I was trying to fix, right? Mm. But this feeling of all these parts of myself just coming together and be like, okay, we are a, we are a team. We are team Anna. Mm. To me, that's, that's true healing when that integration happens. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm feeling the wholeness of that. So. Yes. And reminds me a bit of our in internal family systems. Do you know anything about that? And the parts yes. of us, and you know, <laughs> all the parts get heard, and you know, they all have their opinions, and <laughs> and 
as a whole, they're, they're you know fundamentally trying to help us thrive and be happy. So, and so, eighteen months of eighteen years of of healing. And of course, you know, I'm assuming healing continues because there's other ways to heal than just around that, the, the bipolar. How did you come to the point where it was, I'm going to be a relationships coach? Yeah. So when I became a student of relationships, I felt like a door, a big door opened up for me because on one hand, it helped me understand the trauma that I had experienced. I learned internal family systems. So I learned my parts and, and what was going on with my parts. And going through relationship school was in itself a very healing experience. Mm-hmm. And while I was in school, I realized that I had experienced, I I had not met John Demartini. I had not done his work. I have done some pieces of his work, but not really taking a deep dive. Hmm. And that was in itself already enough uh, for me to decide that I wanted to help other people with their relationships. Because as human beings, we are complex and we come into relationship with another human being. And now we have two individuals who are complex. And that's one of the reasons why relationships are complex. In addition that we don't learn relationship skills at at school or at home, at least I didn't and most people don't. So once I figured out enough about relationships, I decided that I, that was going to be my, my soul's purpose to switch careers, retire from working in computers and make the leap into becoming a relationship coach. Mm, Was that a hard decision? Uh, It was an easy decision. And I think what was hard was the timeline that that would require, because I'm talking about just finances and all these things that I needed to to shift and rearrange. And mm-hmm. and the thing that is hard, and uh, I like that you asked that, is the thing that was hard for me was creating a business like coaching relationship coaching was hard but it was eventually I, I i studied enough and practiced and and got it got it down but it's like well now i need to build a business to offer that coaching to people and to get people to know me as a relationship coach so it's been like hurdle after hurdle after hurdle and um and one of the things that I appreciate is that in on that path is how you and I um, connected. Yeah, yeah. So we we connected in through through a shared coach that we had, um, Shani Taylor, mm-hmm. and the the timeline. Something about timelines that I observed. We have the. Well, yeah. I don't know if this is the best description, but we have a soul shift where we connect more with the soul and this is what we want it for our lives. But then the physical realm takes time to adjust. And in the moving of the, the physical realm and all those pieces coming into alignment, it means we're more able to live the way we want to live because we've had to navigate that that timeline that you talked about. And how did you learn about your relationships to to all those things as you're growing your business? Is that a clear question? Yeah. So it's interesting because part of my background is um, 
is business, international business. So I had a sense of business. So when I made the decision to, um, it was actually a year. No, it wasn't. Yeah, it was a year into being in the relationship school that I decided this is what I want to be doing. And I was not a relationship coach yet. Mm -hmm. um, and I decided I made myself a plan of 10 years. And I'm currently seven years into that plan. Wow. So in my plan, it was going to take me 10 years to, to have to switch careers and have a business as a relationship coach. So I'm already seven years into that 10 year plan. So I had some background to come up with that kind of forecast because you are right. The soul moves faster than, than the physical, mm. the physical realm. Yeah. And, and how do you, manage that for yourself when you when you can see what the soul's vision is but then the physical realm appears to be taking i'm going to put in inverted commas too long <laughs> well how i manage was i apply myself to uh i work really hard i was actually working full time and going to school to the relationship school at nights lunchtime, weekends. Um, I was doing my practice hours with clients really whenever I, I had a, ta a time to do that. So what I did was I'm just going to apply myself all of it. And, um, and I just stay, stay like that until I was ready to retire from computers and then do, do the business full time do the coaching full time. How did that feel the day you retired from computers? <laughs> it felt really good. Um, a little sad and nostalgic uh, because mm. it was my dream since I was a little kid to study computers. Yeah. Um, and, and the joy that this is what I want to be doing. This is what inspires me. Um, mm. Yeah. Because there's duality in that, right? You you mm -hmm. retired from computers, which was following your dream, and computers was part of the dream, but there was joy and there was sadness. I think a lot of people reject the duality and a lot of suffering comes from rejecting the duality. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think for me, I'll, if there's something that I've learned is to is to feel all the emotions. Mm. Uh, if there's joy, if there's sadness, whatever is coming up, to feel it, so that as you said, it doesn't stay stuck and turns into suffering. Yeah, I, I think. You no, know, and I know I'm guilty of this at times too. Is that the the vision. And when it doesn't come in the time frame I want it to come in, and it should come in that time frame that I want it to come in, when it doesn't come in, there's I, I had this realization that I was living in disappointment mm. because I, I wanted it now. And I could have been perfectly happy in the now, but I was living in the disappointment that I didn't have whatever it was I was seeking right now. And so if I think about Dr. John D. Martini, that's that out of balance is that the there's disappointment. And so the emotional charge is because my expectations were out of balance. Is that what sort of along the lines of his work? Uh, yeah, that's, that's one way to think about it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. Do you have any other ways to think about it? <laughs> there, what, what, else, what else is there for you? Oh, um, there is so much. There really is so much to to unpack about about his work mm. that um, sometimes it's hard for me to to put it into into words. Yeah, because there's, there's yeah, there's really a lot. But yeah, the moment that we have this appointment is because we have an expectation. And we either put ourselves below the expectation or above the expectation. 
-hmm. instead of adjusting the expectation. Um, what do you mean by below or above the expectation? Um, so, so if we don't, if we don't meet the expectation, then mm -hmm. we start beating ourselves down and mm -hmm. we make ourselves wrong. We start telling ourselves messages that we're not enough. So that's why, um, so that's an example of putting ourselves like below the expectation. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that's where uh, feelings of depression come in as well. Because basically what happens is we fear what we don't have. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm 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 processing that one. We fear what we don't have. Um, yeah. can you explain that more? So we we have the disappointment of what we don't have. Mm -hmm. That's what an unmet expectation comes from. A, so we're putting ourselves below. So to balance that is to look at the benefits of not meeting the expectation. And that's where we come back into balance. Yes, yes. And I think with Dr. John Martini's influence and, and also the coach I mentioned earlier, Shani, she she's a Martini facilitator. And, and that definitely has impacted me in that, so, for example, yesterday I experienced a disappointment, but mm -hmm. almost instantly I went, okay, oh, that means I can do this and this and this and that, oh, this is possible. Oh, and I was excited. And so, whereas in the past I might have been stuck in the disappointment for a long time, it was yeah. just like, oh, how exciting. How exciting things didn't go as I expected. Yeah. Uh, you know. And perhaps I've gone above the expectation, then I'm going to have to be brought back to a medium ground. But <laughs> possibly, <time will tell. laughs> possibly. But ba basically, what he does is to look at benefits and drawbacks, mm -hmm. benefits of not being where we want to be, and drawbacks of being where we thought we wanted to be in. And that's the quickest way to come back into balance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I like I appreciate that you uh, that you mentioned Shani Taylor because mm -hmm. she she's currently my mentor, mm -hmm. and she has been instrumental in uh, me doing my work of healing and integration. Because with John the Martini, I learned a lot about the, the Martini method, and really with Shani is with whom I have implemented it and um has held the space for me to um to continue growing into my own my my own being so she's definitely someone that i feel grateful because her experience with the martini method and her own personal work has really been key in my journey of of healing and integration Mm, yeah, Shani's definitely somebody who's adding value to the world and acknowledging that. And and she also has a great balance with her business sense, phenomenal business sense. So, yeah, so Shani, you'll probably end up listening to this at some point. So hello. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and if not, she can feel the the love from from here. So Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. So... Your last name is Ruiz, and I'm a fan of Miguel Ruiz, who wrote the book, The Mastery of Love, which is, I can't remember the, the rest of the title, it's something like The Art of Relationships or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've got some quotes here from the book, and I thought perhaps I could read them to you, and then we can have a chat around your perspectives on relationships in relation to those quotes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, let's have a look here. And if anyone's listening, well, I know people are listening, but I will put the link to the book in the show notes too, if you're interested in exploring that book. So what about this one? It, it, it doesn't matter how much you love someone, you are never going to be what that person wants you to be. Wow. I, the way I understand 
that and I very much agree is when we come into a relationship and I'm talking about romantic relationships mm -hmm. this can also apply to parents and children and kids but when we come into a relationship with someone we can't change the other person we may have dreams and aspirations and things we want them to do but there's something called free will and we can we can't change the other person and i think the same applies with parents and kids um and you are a father so you can probably relate to what i'm going to say or not mm -hmm. um you your job here is to to teach to guide um but you can't change your your kid mm -hmm. you can try Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think that's a, and I, I've been there in relationships where I've been trying to change the, the person and it's quite possible that I sometimes still slip back into that, even though, you know, it, it's a pattern, but it's, you know, compared to what it used to be like, it's, you know, it's almost non-existent, but that actually I, something from that book, The Mastery of Love, that really resonated for me is that fear is trying to fix somebody and love is knowing that they will work it out. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That's beautiful. Mm. I agree with that. Yeah. So how do you, when you're doing relationship coaching, how do you teach people that? How do, how do, how does that, how do you get that through to people so that they can understand or see that they're trying to fix the other person and then that's causing conflict? Yeah. So it really depends on, on the couple and their level of awareness or even with individuals, this comes up mm -hmm. and I gently ask them the question of, well, do you want your partner to change you? And by flipping the question, more often than not, they come to the realization that they don't want their partner to change them. And therefore, um, there has to be respect and loving the other person for who they are. And that is true love. Mm. Loving, loving the for who they are. Mm. I'm feeling the freedom in that. It's like, oh, thank God, I don't have to fix them. <laughs> I can just love them for who they are. Yeah. And then on the other side of that is when you mentioned fear, and yeah, fear and wanting to control the other person is one reason. The yeah. other part is we, and this is, this is again, uh, John Martinez's work, we judge in others our partners and our friends and we judge in other people and we're projecting these own parts of ourselves. So when there are parts of ourselves in our shadow that we reject, that we don't want to like look at, what happens is we those parts of ourselves get mirrored in other people, in our partners, especially, mm. and we judge them when mm. we don't realize that what we judge in them is something about ourselves that we don't like. Mm. So when we can see that, when we can, it's, it's human to judge it is, it's human and it's normal. The work is to look at those judgments and see in ourselves those parts that we are disowning and owning them. Mm. Yeah, because... And yeah, yeah, and that's where relationships become healing. When we start to own our parts. Yeah, own the things that we judge in others. All right, which requires, I imagine, courage and vulnerability. 
to own those parts. Yeah. So how does one go about, hmm, okay. Here's an interesting scenario, right? The, I'm wanting, you know, and this is hypothetical, by the way, I'm wanting yeah. some, my, my partner to own parts of themselves but then I can't do anything about it because that's not love. And so then what I need to do is own parts about myself. Is is that right? Is is do your work and model that to them. Mm -hmm. mm. The moment that you want your partner to do something we're going back to wanting to fix them, wanting to change them. Um, mm -hmm. The best thing to do is to model. And, and sometimes you're just doing your work, you're going to change and the other person is going to change. Mm. But if you're doing the work so that they will change, then that's <laughs> going to lead to resentment possibly. Exactly. Yes. Yes. It starts so, to get muddy. Yeah. And then if I hold the mirror up, why am I resenting? Because I'm rejecting an aspect of myself. Yes. Because you're resenting because you're having an expectation about them. Mm -hmm. That's all realistic. Mm -hmm. That's why you're resenting them. Yeah. Yeah. Is it John Demartini who talks about, I think it is that, whenever we start getting angry or resentful towards other people, it's because we expect their values to be the same as our own values. Uh, yeah. He's, he's known for talking about values and um, yeah. Anger and resentment uh, because mm. yeah, we want people to have the same values as us. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That comes from him. Yeah. I, I think that's a really powerful thing to realize and, and creates a lot of freedom for people when they realize that we all have different values and that my expectation of that person is creating the resentment because I expect that their values are my values and that's not mm -hmm. going to change. You know, the, 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 the values stay the same. And so I'm expecting them to change their values. Oh, actually va can values change? The values change, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's it's just what you describe. We we want at the core, we want other people to be like us instead of loving them and appreciating them for who they are. Mm. Yeah, and and what do you find with couples when they have that realization and they're able to integrate that? Um, it softens uh, the dynamic a little bit, and it's something that they have to they have to practice because oftentimes um, they come with these ideas that are so ingrained that really the work is to practice, 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 so that they're building a, a new neural network in the brain. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And how do you find those, those, those relationships go when those people are able to do that? Uh, they come to a place of just more respect and more understanding for each other, more peace, more harmony, mm. uh, less fights. And granted, some of the couples or the majority of the couples that I work with are on the verge of divorce. Mm -hmm. uh, therefore they know that they have to change or or their marriage is going to end so their motivation for change is is higher mm. yeah it's it's interesting sometimes how people only want to get the fire hose when the fire is just about to burn the whole house instead of just getting it when it's just small I I totally agree with you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. Yeah. And of course, you know, I've been guilty of that many times, right? In, in many different situations in my life. <laughs> uh, 
Um, shall I give another quote to you? We'll see what yes, comes up. Yes, I'm curious. Mm -hmm. Ooh, what about this one? So this one is about need. The one who has the little need is the one who controls the, the relationship. You can see this dynamic so clearly because usually in every relationship, there is one who loves the most and the other who doesn't love, who only takes advantage of the one who gives his or her heart. You can see the way they manipulate each other and their actions and reactions. They're just like the provider and the drug addict. Ooh. Mm. Yeah, that, that, um, yeah, what comes to me is the person the person with the be with the vulnerability or the wound will be at the mercy of the other person mm. yeah like this happens in in abusive relationships and i don't want to say all abusive relationships but there's there's a common thread in abusive relationships where one person has a vulnerability or or a deeper need and they become dependent on the person who meets that need mm. even if it's in a in an abusive way yeah and so how does one work with that in a relationship um for the person who feels that they've been abused um, they they have a tendency to feel stuck in victim. So the work is to help them become empowered and to heal those wounds or or those those voids in themselves, and they're able to stand up and leave the relationship. Mm. Or make changes but in most cases it's it's leave the relationship once they become empowered then they don't need the drug anymore so they can leave mm -hmm. the drug dealer right yeah yeah i hear so much of what you're saying in this conversation is around becoming empowered in ourselves and owning ourselves owning our patterns owning our our joy owning the things that meet our needs which then gives freedom to the relationship. Yes. Yeah. Mm. With a caveat that we have needs that are relational needs. So I don't want to give the impression that we can, we as individuals, we can get all our needs met because that is not how it happens. When we come into, we all have relational needs. We want to feel seen. I can't look at myself in the mirror every morning and be like, okay, I can see myself. I can see myself. No, at some point I need, I need you Ash to look at me and say, Oh, Anna, you, you have worked really hard this week. And then, Oh, now I feel seen. Yeah. Right. So that will be an example of a relational need. We want to feel seen. We want to feel appreciated. Uh, we want to feel supported. Uh, we want to feel challenged. We need challenge to grow and we need to feel soothed. And those needs come through being in relationship. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a romantic relationship. It can be through, for people who are single, they can get those needs met through friends. Mm. Yeah, that's a really powerful message. Mm. Yeah, because it's, well, I think we're often told, oh, you should be happy on your own, which is different to being happy in isolation. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, we're, as human -y, human beings, we are, um, we're mammals. So we're pack animals. We need other human beings. Mm. Yeah the, the, idea, uh, yeah, the idea yeah. of like the yogis who go and 
um, stay in a cave for three months on their own. I mean, they they dedicate their lives to be able to do that. But as human beings, we do need to be around other human beings. Mm. Yeah, I'm thinking about, you know, it used to be punishment, in, well, and still is punishment, is, is that you get kicked out of the tribe. And and yeah. that has a, a physical pain to it. And so many people won't make changes in their life because they're scared of being kicked out of their tribe. Quite yeah. possibly they're unaware of that fear that's there, but it's this primal fear that's in us is mm-hmm. to fear what the tribe will think of us. And therefore we stay stuck and not making the changes. Yeah. And really it's an illusion and we, we, you know, we're more resourced than ever to be able to change tribes to survive, you know, it, whereas in the past we would be in the jungle or the desert or whatever it is on our own, we'd be more likely to, to die. Exactly. And that's why that, that fear is still wired in our, in our brain, like our primitive brain still has that wiring of I'll get kicked out and then I will die. So it's mm. protection. Yeah. Mm. And it's it's just so interesting, I think, between the, the battle that happens between the thrival brain and the survival brain. It's like where we live in this, where we're very resourced, the most resourced humanity's ever been that we're aware of. And yet we still have this primal brain that's that's saying, oh, be careful. Oh, no, you can't do that. Don't do that on your own. Don't, don't do that social media post, whatever it might be. It's like, oh, stay small. <laughs> yeah mm, mm. let's have let's have a look at one more quote i'm i'm conscious of time and let's see nothing that your partner does is personal your partner is dealing with her own garbage if you don't take it personally it will be so easy for you to have a wonderful relationship with your partner yes this is one that is one of my uh my my husband, he talks about not taking things personally. Because mm. the moment that we take things personally, then our feelings are hurt. And then we get into this connection from the other person. And then this connection leads to uh, arguments, leads to conflict. But basically what happens is we're always projecting our own reality onto the other person and just and everyone it's just our our own reality it's kind of like wearing glasses and I'm wearing like the pink glasses and you're wearing the yellow glasses and everyone's wearing their own color and that's their own reality but the moment that we take things personal and we make it about ourselves it just creates a disconnect Mm. Yes, and then interesting, the behaviors that come from feeling disconnected, but the behaviors are trying to get us connected. So, yeah, for example, I yeah. might get angry because I'm feeling the the hurt of the disconnect and the anger is trying to create connection, but it creates more disconnect. Yeah, yeah. So that's the whole, um, we may not have a lot of time to dive into this, but uh, the reason why I am self-proclaimed queen of conflict repair is for that exact reason, because conflict is a process of disconnect and repair is about getting back into connection. And this duality happens in relationships. We cannot be in connection 100% of the time. And if we are in disconnect, then we may as well not be in a relationship. So this ebb and flow of connection and disconnection is something that um, I really enjoy um, teaching people about conflict repair. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's so important because, it, like you just said, there's always going to be moments of disconnection and, and that when we get skilled at reconnecting, then it leads to deeper intimacy, deeper love, deeper connection. Yeah. Yeah. And again, it's it's a skill and people who want to learn how to repair conflict, they they can learn. And um, it is to me, it's a very important skill because in at least in the United States, one of two 
uh, marriages end up in divorce. And the data says, the census data says that the number two reason, number two reason for divorce is argue too much. Hmm. So if people learn how to argue, that number of divorces can go down. And it doesn't mean, I'm not saying we can stop all divorces. There are time, there are reasons why divorce may be necessary. But if people are getting divorced because they can't stand arguing, they're arguing too much. How about you learn how to fight well? <laughs> yeah, oh, I like that. Learn to fight well. And and so I know if there's somebody out there listening who thinks, oh, I would benefit from connecting with you. What's the best way for them to do that? Well, the best way would be to go to my website and the the URL will be in the show notes. And you can, there's a contact form and you can reach out um, to me personally through that contact form. And um, you can look on my website, some of the other things that I'm doing. There's some programs that I'm offering, group coaching programs. Um, I help couples and individuals one-on-one. Um, I have a blog. Um, I also do, I'm very active on Facebook. And uh, once a week, I have, I host uh, relationship recipes from my kitchen. Hmm. So people can send me questions and anything you want to ask about relationships. And right from my kitchen, I um, answer those questions every week. Yeah. And I recommend following Anna on Facebook. I love your social media posts. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ash. Yeah. Well, thank you, Anna Ruiz, for joining today. It's been wonderful to have you on Beyond Turning Points. Uh, thank you, Ash. I really, really enjoy uh, being here and um, being a guest on your podcast. And yeah, thank you again, um, everyone who's listening. Thank you.